Hello and welcome to a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. I'm Prashant with me, my colleague Sonia and Nigel. Guys, hi, good morning. Good morning. morning. You know, I think we have to stop talking about new highs, right? I think that's the only way we're going to get them because uh, this is not helping. <laughs> the waiting game. The preparation is not helping, Sonia. I mean, it's like, I think we're uh, jinxing it, so we've got to reverse jinx it. Uh, in any case, I mean, you know, global queues are supportive. They're not too bad. Uh, U.S. markets did sell off. I mean, equities did sell off. And I'll come to that. It was a peculiar kind of session because uh, there was a little correlation. I'll explain why. But I think, to my mind, the big cue is that U.S. market interest rates continue to fall. Uh, the five-year, the 10-year, the 30-year, you've got, uh, you know, eight basis points fall on the 10-year, the benchmark, 30 down 12, and five down five basis points. In the last two sessions, the benchmark 10-year is down 16 basis points. I mean, that's quite something. The SGX Nifty uh, is, of course, reacting to the 1.5% cut that we saw on the NASDAQ. It's starting about 75 points lower. 18,405 is where we will start today's session at with an hour to go uh, for the market opening. Guys, good morning. Hi, good morning, uh, Nigel. Good morning, Prashant. And, you know, our markets are virtually at those highs, right? There were record closing highs that we saw yesterday as well. The Bank Nifty hit a record high, uh, a closing high of 42,535. So we are virtually at those levels. Uh, there is profit taking that's seen across glo most global markets. So it's not too much, but the Nasdaq was down about 175 points. The Dow lost about 40 odd points or so. There are some geopolitical tensions that are rising in Europe. So, you know, there's been a bit of a sell off over there. The DAX was down over 1%. Um, now, for our own markets, flows have dried up a bit. FIIs have sold about uh, 400 crores or so. DI has bought quite a bit. But this is still a buy on dips market. And there is, uh, once again, the TINA factor, right? Because there's so many issues happening with some of the other asset classes. Like crypto, for example, the news is getting worse. Uh, latest is that the crypto broker Genesis has suspended redemptions because of, uh, you know, there is massive withdrawal requests that they are facing. So now a lot of money perhaps is moving back into equities and we are virtually at those highs. So this buy on dips is something that could continue and banks could continue to be in focus as the RBI governor met with a lot of the banking heads. So uh, they met C CEOs of PSUs, private banks, etc. Uh, so, you know, banks could continue to be in focus. But otherwise, uh, yes, there is a sell-off that's expected today, yeah. this morning. But the buy on dip strategy is something that has worked. It has worked, Sonia, and uh, we'll have to see if it continues to work. By the way, you said Tina, right? Yes. I heard another one, uh, Tara. Uh, there are reasonable alternatives. Okay. <laughs> Which could be fixed income. I mean, Ajay Srivastava was yes. talking about that, right? Uh, that uh, with a one-year kind of view, if you're able to lock in these kind of rate, these kind of yields, basically, I mean, it's not a bad idea. Uh, you got a 9, 9.5%, 11% on lower rated paper, etc. But that's a discussion we'll have later. Let's just quickly take a look at uh, you know where markets left off. So US equities uh, saw weakness. Retail sales report was strong. It was actually very strong. Uh, so could you link the two? Perhaps yes. I mean, in any case, weakness uh, was uh, pronounced after the retail sales showed very uh, a, a very strong number. But the fact is, retail sales had no effect on U.S. yields, right? I mean, if the fear is that the, the economic data is starting to turn up once again, it's not exactly weak like the inflation number was, uh, then uh, and the Fed will hike, then market interest rates should move up. Absolutely no impact on U.S. yields. So I think the dynamic which is at work perhaps is something else. Uh, big fall in U.S. yields again. The 10-year was uh, is down 8 basis points to 3.69. As I said, 16 basis points uh, in the last two days. On Tuesday, which was uh, you know the first rates uh, trading session for this week, because Monday was a holiday in the rates market in the U.S., you had a so accounting for the week Friday till date, uh, you know the ten year is down twelve basis points. The difference between the ten year and the two year is now minus sixty seven basis points. This basically is telling you that markets and uh, markets mainly are not very optimistic of uh, economic prospects likely down the down the road. Uh, this is what is so basically what's happening is the two year is falling but the 10 year is falling much sharper in a much sharper way and the difference is uh, you know now minus 67 basis points um, the dollar saw a little movement as well the dxy is stable at about 106.4 uh, brent oil prices well behaved they're under 93 dollars a barrel so really no problem there uh, i think you know you get a cut so uh, you basically make yesterday's low as the first marker, which comes in at about 18,272, uh, you know. And then you get the 20-day moving average, which is further away, which is only at about 17,969. But I would say, 
you know, uh, give it at least, uh, don't jump in straight away. Let the market kind of trade for a while, the first couple of hours, see the de texture, see the direction. Sometimes it's important to read the screen and the screen tells you a lot. Uh, and uh, then take a call one way or the other. Because, uh, you know, if the market has been showing a little bit of hesitation, signs of, you know, exhaustion perhaps at uh, all-time highs, near all-time highs. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, you can get setbacks before we finally climb and uh, cross the uh, all-time highs. Could today be one of the sessions, at least at opening, it is going to be a half a percent lower. We'll find out what happens once things start. Nigel, what are you watching? Well, you know, for me, the two big indicators, that's the dollar index as well as the Brent crude prices, they are well behaved. Yeah. So I like that, you know, that's in terms of the global queues that are coming up. The buy on dip strategy is working on the headline index. That's the Nifty and the Nifty Bank. However, the breadth of the market has been lagging, which is a little bit worrying. Because we are talking about this brisk move from around, what, that 18,000 to around 18,400. That's in the last three, four trading sessions. Right? In fact, the breadth of the market has been lagging. The mid-cap index is low. The small cap index hasn't done much. So uh, you'd like to see that catch up. Then you get bigger confidence that, in fact, yes, we are uh, in a strong bull run. Yesterday, the reason that we did see a big uh, move uh, from the day is low is because the Nifty, well, there was some covering out there. The Nifty Bank as well, the open interest was low, and that as well did recover a goodish bit. So short covering played out. And if you look at the FI data, well, that perfectly tied in. The, they covered some shots, they added long positions. They continue to remain net long on the index, which on 65% of their positioning is on the long side now. On the index option side, well, they bought 40,000 contracts, both on the call as well as on the put side. But what's encouraging is they continue to write puts. And in two sessions, they've written closer on one lakh puts. That's giving some sort of a base uh, because the previous session, it was closer on 60,000 contracts that were uh, written. What are the levels you're looking at? I think the 18,300, 18,330, that could be a good entry opportunity. And I say that because yesterday there was some unwinding at that 18,300 put, but there was built up at around that 18,400 put. The premium out there was around 50 rupees. At one point of time, it was around 70 rupees. So that's telling you that 18,300, 18,330, the bulls are playing for that level holding out. And today, remember, is expiry. The bears, though, they seem to be putting in a fight and they were writing that 18,400 call yesterday. Very, very active. Remember, the total premium out there, you, you know, was around 59 rupees or thereabouts. And the open interest was close to around 86 lakh shares. So close to around the crore shares odd. Highest open interest at that strike. So around that 18,400 and 75 odd, there'll be a fight that comes in there. SGX, if you suggest a bit of a downtick, buy on dips likely to continue. However, keep an eye out on the breadth of the market. That's been lagging a little bit. So now what else? Also, you know, I just wanted to mention the fall in the US markets overnight was also because Target went ahead and slashed its forecast for spending. Yes. And the, uh, the, the phrase that they coined is that there could be a precipitous decline in discretionary spending. Now, this is important because this comes after FedEx and Amazon predicting a slowing down of holiday demand. And holiday season is big in the US. So this this talks more about, uh, you know, how perhaps consumer spending could be a bit muted and the impact it could have on the economy. So that's important to point out as well. Uh, but we have lots to talk about on the show in the next uh, two and a half hours. So first up, we have a comment coming in from Sanjay Mukim of JP Morgan who says that an analysis of company quarterly disclosures suggests that individual investors were net sellers of equities in the September quarter, even as FIIs turned buyers. He said there is a risk to flows if reports of changes to capital gains come true. He also added that lower liquidity is a greater risk to mid-caps and that investors should look to reduce allocations to smaller Indian stocks. All right, money market views. This is uh, Parul Mithil Sinha of uh, Standard Chartered Bank who says the rupee saw support this week from dollar weakness post US CPI data. Even as wide trade deficit continued to pose headwinds, she expects the dollar rupee to trade in a range of between 81 to 82 a dollar next week with a buy and dips. Buy, as she says, elevated trade deficit, uh, RER uh, overvaluation, and uh, oil prices above $90 per barrel levels are likely to keep the rupee under pressure. All right, and on the bonds, Parul Mithal Sinha says domestic yields corrected lower this week in line with global rates and on expectations of a slower pace of rate hikes by the MPC in December. She expects the 10-year benchmark bond yield to trade in a range of 7.2 to 7.35% next week. She also says the key driver for the rate market would be the timing of the pivot by global central banks on early signs of easing inflation pressures. She says that some domestic market participants are discussing the possibility of a lower terminal rate versus 6.5% earlier. Well, there are a lot of stock-specific action to track for you, and we'll get to our special top 10 segment in just a bit. We're looking at Subin Life Sciences, Auto Pharma, Hindustan Zinc, Vedanta, 
Exide, Bikalchi Foods, Global Health, uh, that's uh, Midanta, as well as Balrampul Chini. Well, all of them on the back of positive news flow. While we have Tata Motors and PTM, both of them are stocks that are likely to open up in the red. By the way, just keep an eye out on the bottom of your screen. We have a deal that's just uh, taken place. Uh, our systems, Blackstone actually is going to be going ahead and buying majority stake. I think the current market price is around the price at which this deal is happening, around uh, 245 odd. Yeah, that's uh, uh, around that stake. But big deal taking place out there. I think closer around 3,000 crores odd is what the entity is being valued at. We'll get you further details out there. And then they'll be launching a delisting offer as well, though the price is more or less where uh, the stock ended yesterday. All right, 235 uh, is the current market price, 246 or so is where the uh, this offer is uh, coming at. Uh, so we'll uh, try and get in touch with the management of uh, our systems listed entity. Matt Orton is Chief Market Strategist at Raymond James Investment Management. He's uh, joining us uh, to take some questions. Matt, great to have you with us here. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Uh, so uh, how are things looking, Matt, now? U.S., uh, it's just explain the price action. You know, market interest rates in the U.S. are dropping sharply. I mean, yields are down six. The benchmark yield, uh, the, the, the tenure is down 16 basis points in two days, and stocks uh, came off as well. So, what's the dynamic at work? Uh, you know, markets trying to price in some economic pain going forward. Hey, Prashant, great to see you and great to talk to you again. And the, the price action in the U.S., we've just come off a pretty ferocious rally after the CPI data that we got last week. I mean, we had a historic rally across U.S. markets. You hadn't seen those types of gains outside of uh, the pandemic or the global financial crisis, you know, outside of a few instances in the past 50 plus years. So the market is fairly exhausted. And we can't lose sight of the fact that there's still a lot of macro uncertainty. So whenever I'm talking to our clients about how to think through all the different dynamics that are happening in the marketplace, it's really don't chase the market higher because you're going to have days just like we had today where the market comes down and you're going to have better entry points to get into the market. You know, as we've talked before, I certainly have a more optimistic long-term view, but we're not out of the woods yet. We're so preoccupied on a pivot that we've lost sight of the fact that the terminal rate forecast still hasn't changed. And as a result, it's, it's just too early to be getting really, really optimistic. So I'd say the U.S. is in a recalibration mode. Uh, nothing to be too concerned about, but certainly it highlights again why you don't chase the market higher. Okay, so don't chase this market. You could get better entry points. Uh, thanks a lot for joining in, uh, Raymond. I wanted your thoughts on what's happening in the U.S. in terms of consumer spending, because uh, you know the latest we hear is that Target has slashed their forecast on consumer spending. You had FedEx and Amazon do that earlier. Uh, is that a red flag from an equity market standpoint? And how, how would you read into it? Yes, yeah, so yeah, I don't think it's a red flag with respect to equity markets. It's just a reminder that it really matters where you're positioned within the equity markets. And the U.S. consumer is dynamic. It's incredibly broad based. And there's areas that probably aren't going to be working very well in the near future. And there's areas that continue to work. So we've had a mixed bag of earnings. We had Target this week, but Home Depot and Lowe's both had really good earnings. And everyone's been saying the uh, the trend for home renovations, rising rates, people aren't buying new houses, but you continue to see people spend on those different types of items, what people aren't spending on. And I think Walmart earnings corroborate that it is the fact that people don't want to buy more stuff. People are spending more money on experiences. People are going out and doing things, taking vacations, going to see family. We've heard from the airlines that bookings through holiday season and well into 2023 remain strong. So that to me says that the consumer is still healthy. Uh, you're not seeing any sort of delinquencies tick up with respect to credit card debt, paying off mortgages. So there really aren't a lot of red flags, but all of these earnings reports, when you take them in totality, is just a reminder that the, the stocks that you pick matter. You can't just own the basket of consumer discretionary anymore or consumer staples because there's a lot of idiosyncrasies and you need to know what you're owning. Hi, Matt. Morning. Uh, you know, I recall you were talking about the Indian markets and Latin American markets. They still look pretty good and you were quite bullish on that. But what about the Chinese market? Uh, you know, there's still a lot of uncertainty out there. But everything is good at a particular price. Is that price right now? Yeah, that's very true. Most things are good at a particular price. You never want to be catching the falling knife. And I would have put China into that category earlier this year. 
I think from a global perspective, I still prefer the U.S. I prefer Latin America, Brazil, Mexico. Colombia has been ticking up on my radar from financials and material standpoint. Uh, but China does look more interesting, especially if we continue to see some follow through with respect to the zero COVID policy. So China has just been so incredibly oversold really for the past 18 plus months. So from a valuation perspective, it looks very, very compelling. The challenge is I think there's still going to be issues with Chinese technology. There's still regulatory questions that we don't have answered. So when I look at China, especially around the reopening, I think companies that are a little bit more exposed to call it the new China economy, the middle class, um, people going out and being able to spend a little bit more money again, those look more attractive as do companies that are related to infrastructure spending, areas where we know China is going to continue to invest in order to match the spending that's happening around the rest of the world. So I think China is certainly on my radar. I do not put it above India or Latin America or the U.S from an investment perspective, mm. but for people who might be willing to take some, some losses in the near term, the entry point is attractive for the right securities. Mm. Uh, the problem with India is uh, valuations are also not cheap anymore and you, know, you do st still have global concerns that could have a snowball effect on the Indian market as well. Uh, what do you do as an Indian investor now? I think, just like I said for the U.S., Sonia, you don't chase the market higher. I think if, if there's going to be a pullback, uh, if we see a continued pullback in the U.S., it's going to impact the rest of the world as well. And so you're going to get a better chance to, to, to get into the Indian market. And last time we were talking, there's certain sectors within the Indian market that I still like and I think still look somewhat attractive from a valuation standpoint. So information technology, in particular, the IT services industry that have more exposure to global consulting and, uh, and, and um, offloading of, of certain practices from the U.S., such as technology back office operations, with such a big focus on margins, uh, companies are still willing to spend to outsource that so they don't have to pay to do it themselves. So I still think that looks fairly compelling. Financials and industrials, I still think, look particularly interesting. But again, I wouldn't be putting fresh money to work when you're sitting near all-time highs. I'd be, I'd be waiting and being opportunistic with my entry point. But those sectors in particular, I think, still offer opportunity. Okay, Matt, we leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining in and have a great day. Uh, that's the word coming in on the global markets. Let's slip into a quick break on that note. On the other side, our entire list of top 10 stocks will be with you. Stay tuned. Different ages, different stages. Get best protection with Star Women Care Insurance Policy. Always at your doorstep. भारी लोड है, गाड़ी फंस गई तो border पर हमारे जवानों तक पहुंचना जरूरी है. Tata Yodha 2.0 जहां जमीन है, वहां रास्ते हैं. इस सुपर फास्ट जमाने में कार इंश्योरेंस क्लेम का स्ट्रेस क्यों? एक्ो ऐप पे क्लेम सेटलमेंट सुपर फास्ट होता है गेट सुपर फास्ट क्लेम सेटलमेंट एक्ो वेलकम चेंज लड़की होने का मतलब ये नहीं कि बंदिशों से दोस्ती कर लो कामयाबी हौसला देखती है जेंडर नहीं इसलिए लाइफ तुम्हारी रूल्स भी तुम्हारे सिग्नेचर ग्लोबल आपके इसी अंदाज को सल्यूट करता है इंडिपेंडेंट फ्लोर्स फॉर द इंडिपेंडेंट यू पूजा यू लेव द जॉब एंड स्टिल सो कूल ब्रो New challenges bring new opportunities. Oh really? Seriously Rahul, my entire house now it's an online retail store. Look. Wow. But money? Few years back I'd invested my Diwali bonus. And now you have LIC's Ulip plan Nivesh Plus. Invest once, get the benefit of both life insurance and maximize returns based on market trends. One sec Rahul. Madam, you are double cool. Welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call. Uh, the latest news flow that just came in is that Blackstone will launch a delisting for our systems at 246 uh, rupees a share. 
They are committed to buy a majority stake in our systems for 2,904 crores. They will buy 52% stake at 245 rupees a share. Satinder Singh Rekhi, who is the CEO of our systems, joins us now to talk about that. Uh, Mr. Rekhi, uh, first, if you can just start by telling us what is the rationale for the stake sale and will the promoters continue to run the business? Uh, thank you for having me. The rationale is that uh, we have reached a point and we need a big partner who can take care of the company and take us to the next level of its growth and take care of its employees, customers and partners. Blackstone is a great partner. That they are very good, employee friendly with their other portfolio companies. And that's why we wanted to partner with them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, will the promoters continue to run the business in any way? If not, uh, what is the next plan of action? And the promoters will be involved. Okay. How it uh, unfolds, we will know as we go along. Okay. I'm definitely going to be involved. Okay. Uh, hi, sir. Oh, good morning. Um, you know, t tell us you're going to be involved in what, uh, you know, in what manner as of now. Uh, as of now, you're running the business. Post uh, the takeover, then what is your role? I, I will certainly be a strategic advisor to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we go along, uh, the role will develop a little more. That, Blackstone has a lot of expertise, so that has to be utilized into the company. All right. Mm -hmm. Sir, you know, you have done this deal with Blackstone, but were there other suitors? Uh, were there any co other companies that approached you? Were there other financial institutions that did put in their bid? Yes, they did. Tell so us. We selected Blackstone because we found that uh, they are very employee friendly mm -hmm. and uh, they build good relationships. So it was a it was an easy choice. But who who were the other suitors in terms of companies? Could you give us a sense? Uh, you know, who were they or? Uh, were there more number of PEs that were uh, trying to come in there and pick up the company? All of the above, but I think mm. it's probably not appropriate to give names of those companies. Yeah, okay. They won't like it. Okay, okay, not appropriate to give names. Just coming back to the rationale, you said you reached a point where you needed a larger company to perhaps come in and take over. Uh, but, you know, IT companies are in the midst of a big digital transformation wave. Why sell now? It is. And it is a, you see, it's always a dilemma mm. whether you do it when it, the wave is going up mm. uh, or other times. But uh, uh, looking at it inside, I think we needed a stronger partner mm. because we are going to get into larger customer bases. So mm. that required a, a heavy weight mm. along with us. Okay. Uh, so is th in terms of delisting, right, yeah. is this a conditional delisting in the sense what if the open offer fails to get you 90% stake, then what is uh, plan B? All that will unfold as we go along. I, I don't think we'll get every information at this moment of time. Uh, you know, uh, so also the entity that's buying you, they own emphasis as well. Do you see some kind of synergy benefits out there? Definitely, but I, I think that they want to keep these separate. Oh, okay. Okay. You said that you will continue to be a strategic advisor and play a role, but what do promoters plan to do with the proceeds that come in? Oh, we don't know as yet. Mm. Okay. Okay. Uh, just one more question before I toss it back to Nigel. Uh, in terms of the business, right, trying to understand, you said you needed a stronger player to come in. Uh, if your margins are much lower compared to a lot of your peers. Uh, what is the prognosis now going ahead? You see, we have an infrastructure. If the revenue rises, the margins will rise. If we get larger deals, margin will rise. So that is one of the strategic goals. All right, uh, Mr. Reiki, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, great speaking with you and uh, good luck uh, now that you've uh, struck this deal with uh, Blackstone. We'll, of course, catch up with you once uh, this starts to materialize. I mean, the process starts moving forward, as you said. We'll know a lot of things then. Uh, let's uh, sort of talk about the top stocks that uh, are on our radar and you need to watch out for as well. Uh, and first on the list uh, this morning is uh, Tata Motors, Sonia. Uh, why is that? So, you know, I'm going with red for Tata Motors because the CEO of JLR has resigned with immediate effect from December itself and resigned for personal reasons. So, JLR CEO, who is uh, Thierry Bolor, has now resigned and uh, Adrian Mardell will be taking over as interim CEO. 
Now, this uh, comes at a time when JLR is going through a lot of financial problems. In Q2, the margins were under a lot of pressure. There was a negative uh, free cash flow as well of 15 billion pounds because of the adverse working capital movement. There are challenges still in markets like Europe. North America has not recovered entirely. Uh, so, you know, at a time like this, a challenging time like this, the resignation of the CEO comes as a negative, and I'm going with red on the stock. Okay, all right. Uh, you know, some uncertainty at the top, so maybe, in fact, some red on Tata Motors. But Ekta joins us to tell us about a couple of pharma companies, Suvin Life as well as Auto Pharma. Ekta? Well, yes, I'll start with Suven Life. Uh, we could probably see a sentiment green because they have said that the company has announced the randomization of the first patient. Basically, they're going to be recruiting the first patient in the phase three global cl clinical trials of one of their molecules, which is under study for dementia in Alzheimer's, which is basically SUVN502. And hence, this could be a sentiment positive. It's a long road ahead because uh, the top line data is only expected by early 2025. Now, now, so when pharma could probably see a rub off simply because there's so much expectation that there could be a stake sale and they need to use that money in order to invest it in the R&D business of Suven Life. Aurobindo, I expect that stock to probably be in the green today because Unit 11 is classified as a voluntary action indicated status by the US FDA. Remember, it has a warning letter which was issued in 2019. And uh, now with the VAI, it's probably got a green signal from the US FDA to manufacture for the US. The warning letter is lifted. But this news was known a couple of days ago and hence probably the best is factored it. All right, thanks a lot for that. I'm also tracking Excite this morning because uh, the company has given, after a very long time, a detailed conference call on the plans that they have with the lithium-ion cell manufacturing business. Now, they're getting into lithium-ion cell manufacturing in a big way, and they've mentioned that phase one of the cell plant will start by the second half of FY25. They expect production to stabilize in FY26. The first phase has a huge capex of 4,000 crores, while the second phase will need an incremental spend of 2,000. Crores. Now, they have reached out to several OEMs for their lithium ion plans and they've got some very strong responses from their legacy customers. So, I'm going with green over there because this is, you know, a new stream of business for them. It will give them more in terms of revenues. Also, Next Charge Unit, which is their battery business, is already supplying electric vehicle batteries to buses, four-wheelers and two-wheelers. And the lead acid business margins are also improving. Remember, the stock has already rallied 25% in the last six months. But this lithium-ion foray is big for them. And, you know, they are sort of keeping up with the times. They're getting into EVs in a big way. And that's something that the street definitely likes. Okay, all right. So we'll keep an eye on next side. But let's focus on Hindustan Zinc and Vedanta. They had a board meet yesterday for the dividend payout. And the board has approved a second interim dividend payout of around 15 rupees 50 paise. The total dividend payout will be around 6,500 crores. Bulk of that will go to the promoter entity, that is Vedanta Limited, which is the listed company. The remainder goes to the government of India. So close to around, you know, 95% of what they're paying out will be going to both these two entities. Now, the Vedanta shareholders as well, Hindustan Zinc shareholders will get this dividend. Since Vedanta is limit, uh, receiving it, Vedanta Limited, that is, the shareholders will be hoping that Vedanta passes that through. And that's uh, something that they've already said, that whatever dividend they get, that's what will be passed on. So if you equate that, Vedanta Limited should be declaring a dividend of close to 11 rupees 50 paise. We'll wait by for that. Expect both these two stocks to be in focus. But that's about these two. Vivek's back with us to tell us about some other stocks that he's tracking. Vivek? Well, good morning. You know, first on my list is Paytm. You know, as the lock-in uh, period expires, for a lot of the you know the recent listings, uh, you're actually seeing quite a bit of a share supply. Uh, a large block is what is expected to happen in trade today, as far as Paytm is concerned. Sources tell us that SoftBank, that owns almost 17 and a half percent stake in the company, is looking to exit almost four and a half percent stake in the company. And via this block deal, they are looking to mop up almost 215 million dollars from this transaction. Now, what is interesting is the price, pricing of this particular offer. The pricing is expected between, you know, the lower end of the price band is 555 and the higher end is around 601. The lower end indicates almost a 7.7% discount to yesterday's closing price. And this is something, uh, you know, post this particular block deal, you know, they will continue to hold almost 12.5% uh, stake in the company. So because of the supply overhang, going with the red on this particular name. Two listings that happened yesterday, some interesting fund action there. Bikaji, Goldman Sachs bought almost 17.5 lakh shares in that particular name. While Global Health, that is Medanta, you saw some fund action from Motilal Oswal Long Fund as also the large and mid-cap fund. You also saw Nomura 
India pick up a significant stake of almost 15 lakh shares as far as Bikaji is concerned. All right, uh, Vivek, thanks very much for that. Uh, of course, I mean, the stronger the, uh, or the two in terms of price action was Global Health, Medanta, Bikaji came off uh, from the listing highs. Uh, Manisha is here to talk about the sugar space, some announcements coming through from the for the sugar sector later, uh, ye you know, yesterday evening. Uh, Manisha, good morning. Oh, well, yes. Uh, you know, now there are two or three things which really seem to be supporting sugar. One, uh, the international markets are trading firm. So you have the raw and white sugar trading at five to seven month highs, respectively. And out of the six million tons which has been allowed for export, four million tons has been contracted yet again. In addition to that, yesterday we saw government allowing sugar exports worth of 14,400 tons to European Union and U.S. And this is under tariff rate quota. This is outside of six million tons. So when you look at the overall math, the expectation is that with the kind of report card that we have, where the production is 36.5 million tons, carryover from last year is at 6 million tons. So that is 42.5 million tons of sugar available in the country. So even as you look at consumption, 6 million tons of export, and the current 14,000 tons of export as well, the expectation being that by the end of January, government could review and allow more exports is something that the markets also seem to be feeding on. Okay, Manisha, thanks a lot for that. So in case you missed out on any of these stocks, here's a quick recap. Stocks with positive news flow. There's Suvan Life Sciences, Aurobindo Pharma, uh, Hindustan Zinc, Vedanta, Excite, Bikaji Foods and Medanta as well as Balram Puccini. While stocks with negative news flow, there's Tata Motors and Paytm. We'll take a quick break. On the other side of the break, Gurmeet Chadda of Complete Circle will be with us to give us some fundamental stock analysis. Later, we will connect with Vimal K. Jriwal of KEC International to talk about their Q2 earnings. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, the SJX Nifty today is suggesting that we'd like to start off in the red. Maybe 85 to around 90 points down tick is what we're bracing ourselves for. So we'll have to keep an eye out on that one. But it was an operationally weak second quarter for KEC International. The company's profit is down over 30%. The margins have seen a sharp contraction to around 4.4%. But we already have those details. The numbers came a few days ago. The positive, though, is that their order book is higher and they won a new order as well to the tune of close to around 1,300 crores yesterday. Uh, Mr. Kejriwal, the MD and CEO of the company, joins us. Uh, hi, Mr. Kejriwal. Good morning. 1,300 crores is what you've got. You've given us, uh, you know, the qualitative details. That's you've got it for a Brazilian subsidy. That's the TND uh, business, the railway business as well for Chennai, as well as Mumbai Metro and the cables business. Break this 1,300 crore order up for us into these three segments. And what's the margin differential? So, Nigel, good morning. Uh, broadly, if you look at it, it's around 60% is from the TND sector. And it's largely largely the Brazil order. And around 35% is from the railways, and the balance is cables. I think the good part on this is that, you know, our Brazil, and you talked about our numbers not being great. So one of the reasons had been the Brazil subsidiary. And this order will really help us in, you know, turning around uh, the, the subsidiary. And as far as the railways are concerned, the first order which we have got from uh, Mumbai Metro. So I think that, that's the significance of this order. Uh, so can you give us a timeline in terms of execution and would you have to raise any kind of capital for execution of this project? No, Sonia, we will not ra be raising any capital for this. Mm. And timeline, is the execution will start uh, next year onwards mm. for all the three of us. Mr. Kejival, uh, good morning, uh, Prashant here. You, you've raised your uh, 23 revenue guidance upwards, right? Uh, yes. Uh, it was 15% earlier and now it stands at uh, 20%. Uh, but uh, w w what do you think margins will be like uh, for the full year and beyond? Because that's where a bulk of the concern really is. So, Prashant, you're right. We raised our margin in the last investor call from 15 to 20 percent on the back of the order intake. We already revenue, ordered. revenue, revenue, you mean? Yeah, I'm yeah, saying sorry. that on the back of the large orders which we got, yeah. so we have an order book plus L1 of 34,000, which, which made us raise our... Uh, revenue uh, guidance. Okay. As far as the margins, as far as the margins are concerned, we actually have three headwinds in the margins. One is on the raw material price. Second is on the freight cost, and third is on the Brazil. So raw material and uh, 
uh, freight are coming down. Brazil also should get over by this quarter. So hopefully from Q4 onwards, we will start seeing an uptick. As far as the numbers are concerned, we have not given any, any specific number for the year. Uh, I don't think we'll see a, a major improvement in the margins for the year. It will start from Q4, but from next year onwards, FI24, we expect the margins you know, to get back to normal. So, uh, Mr. Kejriwal, from uh, quarter one, FI24, by the current reckoning, you're saying that margins go back to double digits? Is it fair to assume? Uh, I don't know whether it will go back to double, but at least it will be definitely maybe closer to 8 or 9 or somewhere, okay. somewhere in the between 8 to 10%. You yeah. know, I just, just wanted to ask you on this growth guidance that you've raised uh, to around 20%. So, you'll end the year with the number of close around 16,500 crores in terms of revenues? Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. and I just break that up for us because the two big contributors are the civil business and railway business. Now, railways, uh, you know, you have been guiding, I think, for around 3,500 to 4,000 crores. Uh, could you tell us what do you end the year up? And for civil, you were saying it will double. So, close around 4,000 crores from there as well? Yeah, bro broadly, the numbers are right. I think we'll, we'll do around 7,000 and odd in transmission and 4,000 each broadly in railways and civil. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have cables of, you know, 1,500, 1,400. So, so broad, these are broad numbers and then we'll have oil and gas at close to 500 crores or something. Mm. That, that's, that would be the broad number. Okay. I want to get back to what's happening with the Brazil subsidiary because you said these orders will help you sort of turn it around. Are you looking at any kind of timeline on when the Brazil subsidiary will uh, turn into the black? So, Sonia, our, our problems has been with a couple of EPC orders which we had. And these EPC orders are all, uh, only one is now left out, which is now almost virtually physically complete, about to be commissioned in maybe this month or early or early next month. So in Q, by, by the end of Q3, we'll be out of all our legacy orders. So that, that's why we are saying that. And then the second part is that, you know, uh, right now we do not have any EPC orders. All the orders are now for supply of, uh, you know, towers and hardware, etc., mm. which are generally, generally profitable. So expectation is that from Q4 onwards, uh, we will definitely have an operating profit in, in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe in the year after, uh, sorry, in FI24, we should start having a positive uh, PBT also. Mm -hmm. So by Q4, FI23, you're saying you'll re you'll get back to operating profit in Brazil? Definitely, yes. Okay. All right. Mr. Kejival, uh, just on that margin point, you said uh, margin should be around 8% uh, or so, right, in 24. Uh, but uh, that is as things stand right now. Uh, do you see? Do you foresee enough uh, levers uh, to uh, to kind of push that higher? Uh, you know, uh, as you as you go forward, and what would those be really? Uh, I mean, if you were to list it out right now. So to me, levers would be. Uh, uh, let's say one is uh, the commodity prices. If they continue to remain, let's say benign as they are today. Mm. Uh, last week we did see some some spike happening, but generally we expect you know. So if commodity prices go a little bit lower or something. That that's number one. Number two is uh, how quickly can we fast track the execution of the current orders? That's the second one. And third is, you know, uh, on the legacy orders where we have lost money, etc. We are in touch with customers, as, you know, saying that they are force measure, the price, the raw material cost went down, went up, and all that. Can we get get something? And I think the last one, which is not on the margin but on the PBT, is on the interest cost. We do expect that you know our working capitals will start uh, becoming normalized and and better. So at the PBT level, the interest cost uh, should also start coming down. You since you spoke about interest costs, what is the current debt in your books and the working capital days? What is it likely to be going ahead? So uh, net debt is around 3,000 and odd crores, plus we have what we call bill discounting, etc. So it's roughly just below 6,000 crores is the total interest-bearing debt which we have. Okay. 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 And where does that number go S since you're ramping up? Do you see it stabilizing out here? Do you see it coming down? And also give us a sense in the working capital days. So, so what we are expecting is that uh, the working capital will, will come down. There will be a need for extra working capital in terms of uh, the ramping up which we are seeing. But our expectation is that we will be able to have a lot more efficiency in the working capital. So despite the revenue increase, we expect the, the, the debt to come down by around 500 crores by March end. Okay, all the best, Mr. Kejriwal. It's always great speaking to you. Get to learn so much about the, both the industry and the business. All the best Thank for the second half of the year. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay, well, that's KC International, but we have Gurmeet Chadda who's joining in now to talk about all of these stocks and more. Gurmeet, where do I start? There's so many stocks to talk about. But first on my list is Tata Motors because of the resignation of the JLR CEO at a time when the business is undergoing challenges. Uh, what would you do if you were a Tata Motors stock owner? 
Uh, hi, Sonia. Uh, I think I think we should just wait for a while and see. Uh, maybe probably get to how the, the leadership succession happens. We've seen that in past in Aisha, Ashok Leland, and and some companies. You know, typically, uh, you know, top level exit uh, can lead to some changes. I think, but if you look at the operating performance, especially Q2, uh, you know, the JLR EBITDA margin was a surprise. It was almost at ten percent. Uh, I was also looking at, uh, because that's still the largest portion for Tata Motors. And if you look at the mix of the products, which is RR, RR Sport, Defender, that seems to be improving. And they've also guided for higher units this year, you know, almost 160,000 units. Uh, uh, also uh, promising reversal of this, you know, networking capital, which has gone up. The India business obviously saw some margin contraction, but continues to do well on, on, on new launches. We have a Tiago EV also launch, which should add to the numbers. Uh, so overall, in a in a watch list for us, remains a portfolio stock for us. Would would wait for because these high level exits, you you can't you know preempt and and say what's going to happen. So better to wait wait for now. Uh, Gurmeet, as a uh, good morning, Prashant here. As a food uh, connoisseur, I think you're the ex you're exactly the right person to ask about Bika Ji. <laughs> I don't know if they have chola butter on their menu, but uh, uh, what uh, how how things? I don't know if you've uh, looked at it as a business. Uh, decent listing yesterday. Uh, any thoughts? Yeah. Uh, Prashant, slightly richly priced, but you know this segment would have uh, you know uh, a slightly higher premium. So you know four or five categories they operate in, which is bujia, namkeen, uh, sweets, and 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 some of the western uh, uh, products as well. Uh, you know, so slightly slightly uh, you know expensive on 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 the valuation front, uh, but you know. Uh, uh, Something of this sort. So Tata Consumer, for example, is related, but this is this is slightly different in this. Uh, you know, uh, if you want to call it as a ready to eat eat segment and and fast moving, you know, food goods in particular. Uh, our portfolio stock continues to be uh, you know Tata, Tata, Tata Consumer, there, which which I think has multiple levels of growth, not only in the 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 salt and the and the coffee and the tea segment, but also in sampan and and you know the ready to eat segments they are getting into breakfast cereals, snacking etc. Starbucks venture possibly turning around this year, so there are multiple levers there, and the stock also has consolidated and so actually down almost fifteen percent from the peak. Okay, hi Gurmeet, uh, good morning. Uh, you know what about Paytm? Uh, now some of those locked up shares are going to be hitting the market. Stock IPO came at around two thousand one hundred. Now, the block deal is likely to have, say, in that vicinity of around 550 to 600 rupees. If you wanted supply, there's unlimited supply. But are you interested? Not, not really, Nigel. Fortunately, I have stayed away from uh, from most of these. There are few, you know, so I would not like to club everything at one. Because the environment right now is that you have a 7.5% on the 5-year and the 10-year government bond, right? Uh, so the discount rate is up. So mm -hmm. anything not profitable, anything where there is no glide part to profitability, I think it's best avoided in an environment like this. Maybe at some point of time, there will be, a, like in Zomato, for example, at some price point, it became attractive from a tactical call perspective. Uh, but this is not a market to, you know, so price correction doesn't really necessarily mean a value buy. Okay. Uh, I wanted your thoughts also on a couple of these stocks like Exide. There was a detailed roadmap given on their lithium-ion manufacturing uh, foray. And you know they're they're getting a very positive response on their new batteries. They're supplying in a big way to the electric vehicle space. Uh, the stock is up thirty percent in the last six months. But you think there's more to go? Um, not really, Sony. I mean, uh, you know, uh, as I said, we are not really looking at transformation and and how, how the new launches are going to play out in this market. You look at you know you need to do financial modeling. You want to clearly be more certain about what your cash flows and you know profits would be. So for example, what we what we buy in this space is Minda. We we have done a two year let's say you know uh, financial plan for them. So we we see the pad going up three x in the next years two and a half years. So we want to do be more certain on what we are buying right now. And in this you know end of the day you have more responsibility when you manage uh, public money. So lesser risk, high, better reward. I think that's that's the play we are trying to do uh, in in anything which we are buying right now. Mm. Gurmeet, uh, what about you know the pockets which are seeing continued momentum? I don't know. I mean you know these uh, rail infra stocks uh, etc. I don't know if they're portfolio stocks, but you know, once they if they continue to do very well, they will right come into that category because they'll have a, a record of steady performance, etc. Uh, they don't have that yet. Uh, but uh, stocks are up 25, 30, 35 percent. Uh, and the other is uh, names like HAL, Bharat Dynamics, the defense names. Your thoughts? So defense names we continue to like, Prashant. You know, have discussed solar industries. Uh, you know, 
multiple times with you. HL also, if you know, we we also track their such as as you know somebody was pointing out earlier in the show. The order execution, you know, year wise is very important because these are long gestation projects. So HL we track you know the the order execution on next two years, three years, five years in terms of Sukhoi, in terms of you know lightweight helicopters, etc. The despite the run up in the stock, I think uh, you know that looks pretty good because that's very important from a working capital point of view. And I think defense remains a, a very very promising play. So we like HL and solar industry. Solar industry continues to be a portfolio stock for us. I was very impressed with what they did in the Defense Expo recently in Delhi. Uh, the kind of uh, uh, products they have in the pipeline they have, not only just in ammunition or, or you know, surveillance system, but also on drones, uh, you know, it's, it's very, very impressive. So it looks, a, looks, a, looks a very promising play. Also some defense, uh, you know, ancillaries, smaller ones. Okay, good myth. What about, uh, you know, the sugar stocks? You have told us about the Chole Bhature, you have told us about, you know, this uh, Bikaji we have discussed. But is it sweet enough for you? You know, Balrampur Chini, they keep saying that they shouldn't focus them as a sugar company because that distillery com commissioning as well is taking place. They're a bit of a tailwind for sugar stocks on the whole. Would you look at them or it's too cyclical, you want to stay away? Yeah, too, too cyclical, like like metal stocks. So, so, Nigel, the better way is obviously the the ethanol story, right? Which where there is a clear blending target by the government. There is a there is, you have an order book with with Paraj, which which is visible till 2025. They are working on uh, you know waste uh, uh, management in terms of uh, the other products they are working on. The diesel blending works, you know, still not started. There's some work happening there. Then there is compressed biogas they are working on. So on clean energy, on, on something which is more sustainable and long-term in energy, I think ethanol looks a better play. Uh, and, and we are invested in Paraj Industries in our, in, in our portfolio for, for quite some time now. Okay, all this talk about Chole Bhature getting me hungry <laughs> <laughs> now. But uh, we're going to take you up on that one. Uh, we need to take a, a short commercial break now. But on the other side of the break, uh, Gurmeet, stay on. We'll come back to you in a bit. So Darshan Sukhani and Mitesh Thakkar will also be with us to talk about some technical trades. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Uh, the ASTX uh, Nifty is indicating a lower start. I mean, uh, lower than where we were at uh, 8 o'clock. 86 points lower, half a percent uh, down, 18,394. Uh, Sudarshan Sukhani and Mitesh Thakkar are with us with uh, technical trading ideas and how they would set things up. Uh, gentlemen, good morning. Good to have both of you here. Uh, Sudarshan, uh, your uh, first thoughts, uh, a lower start. Uh, yesterday, of course, we got a bit of a sell-off towards the end, but then the market pulled right back and we closed unchanged. Uh, what would you do this morning? Uh, good morning, Prashant. See, the markets are consolidating after that big gap up. This is normal. The markets expand in one direction, then they consolidate. And then I assume that they continue to expand in the same direction because the trend is up. So what we are only seeing is a period of consolidation. Think of it as a process in which the market actually has a small dip. Now, all dips for me are buying opportunities. So today's gap down is actually a buying opportunity. It doesn't mean you actually rush in when the market opens. Traders know how to manage a buying, a buying in a gap down. But be patient when you see a sense that the markets, the Nifty is getting stable. I think the trade is to go long and take advantage of that dip. Our stop should be around 18,250. And since we know a stop loss, it's worth going and taking a small risk and going and buying it. Okay, all right. Uh, hi, Sudarshan. Morning. Uh, Mitesh, what about you? Oh, what, what's your view on the index? You're going to get a dip? Jump in? Uh, morning, Nigel. I think yesterday, you know, towards the uh, last hour, while we had some recovery, uh, the overall indicator setup is slightly uh, on the, you know, uh, overbought and mildly weakish side. So I think uh, I would watch the reaction once we hit 18,300, 18,250 zone. I think if that is holding, then we'll take a long there but not with the opening gap. No. I think there, there, there could be slightly more depth than, you know, uh, the opening gap of around 40, 50 points. And I suspect around uh, 18, uh, 300, 18,250, which is about 100 to about 130 points lower from here, that will be a good uh, or a better entry point. Can you tell us what your individual stock ideas are, Mitesh? Because there's been a big comeback in PSU banks, private sector banks as well. Uh, what would you like for trade today if you have to buy the dip? Yeah. So uh, uh, today, I think, you know, uh, I have a mix of buy and sell calls. A uh, couple of uh, defense names, HL is actually on the top of the list and it made a new high in the market, which is kind of uh, uh, losing uh, or, you know, getting sideways. 
HL is a buy with a stop at 26.20 for a target of 2800. Glenmark is a buy with a stop at 4.22 for targets of 4.50. And a couple of calls on the selling side. Apollo Tire gave a fresh breakout, but then the breakout kind of seems to have failed. That's a sell with a stop at 2.82 for targets of 2.65. And India Bulls Housing Finance is a sell with a stop at 1.27.5 for targets of 1.14. Right. Uh, Sudarshan, what about you? What would your trading ideas be? Well, they're mainly on the, the mid-caps uh, because the large caps uh, are likely to see a dip and then we have to wait for some stability, easier to move where some momentum is there. Crompton is a buy. The stock is now bottoming out. That's the sign we get on charts. Stop loss is 3.58. Hero Motor Corp, which has come in my list earlier also, is completing a bullish head and shoulder, a fairly bullish pattern. Buy it with a stop under 26.85. Jubilant Foods is my only intraday short. Intraday short with a stop above 5.65. It's uh, underperforming everything. Berger Paints is a buy. Again, this is a buy on dips opportunity. So we are taking a small risk in anticipation of a larger reward. Stop is under 602. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks a lot for that, uh, Sudarshan. Well, let's go back to Gurmeet Chadda, who's still with us to talk about some stocks. Gurmeet, I don't know if you heard the management of KEC uh, International. They're quite uh, bullish that they'll turn around their Brazilian subsidiary. Uh, you know, their growth forecast is quite positive as well. What do you do with that stock? So, Sonia, it's on the radar. So, what has happened is that if you see their order book, there is this low-cost legacy orders, right? And and the losses in the SE tasks, uh, which which is probably pulling down uh, the EBITDA margin, which almost came at four and a half percent, and and that's what got got you know things slightly on the on the softer note. Uh, but the order book continues to be robust. I think uh, what I'm most impressed is the civil order book they have by TD and non-TD. You know, you also highlighted earlier in the show. The civil order book might double next year, led by both metro, water pipelines, etc. Uh, the only thing we need to watch is how 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 they complete this, you know, uh, low margin legacy uh, orders and and uh, and you know the rising debt they have almost six thousand crores now. Working capital days look stretched, and a rising interest rate scenario. This is not a great uh, you know combination. So so if they can if they can demonstrate some margin improvement, some better execution, I think it's it's definitely on the radar, but not not yet on the on the buy list. Okay, all right, Gurmit, uh, just hang on with us. You know, NMDC as well should be on your radar. I've uh, not got the exact number, but they've cut prices effective today. Uh, so remember, their pricing was resilient for the last couple of months, though global prices were lower. So NMDC is one stock as well that you should be looking at. Uh, Gurmit, uh, you just mentioned that you'd rather stay away from some of these cyclicals. So none of these metal stocks come on your radar? Uh, no, not really, Nigel. See, uh, you know, you got to be tactical, uh, uh, you know, uh, get your entry points right. And, and typically, you know, as, as we always say, high P is the time to enter, low P is the time to exit, right? I, I, I genuinely think the economic slowdown is would be a little more pronounced uh, in West, in, in China than what it is looking right now. And metals are the, are the biggest proxy place to growth. Uh, maybe I'm more interested in commodity consumers now, uh, which, which is auto, which is some of the FMCG names, even in some cases, chemicals and all, which have been very badly hit uh, uh, because of rising logistics, energy, and raw material cost. Okay, Gurmeet, uh, well, we have about, I think, five minutes left for the pre-opening rates to kick in. So we'll just need to take a short commercial break. We'll also have B. Thyagarajan of Blue Star to discuss the Q2 earnings. So do stay tuned in for that. Brought to you by LIC. Har 